Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Ruth, Angela, Oliver, Melanie, Ryan, Barbara, Cynthia, Jana, Candy, and Zachary. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and learning more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's relax with the English Renaissance of Art from Essays and Lectures by Oscar Wilde. First published in book form in limited edition on handmade paper and Japanese vellum in 1908 by Methune and Co. Limited, 36 Essex Street, W.C. London. Let's begin. Dedicated to Walter Ledger by the author's literary executor, Robert Ross. Preface With the exception of the poems in prose, this volume does not contain anything which the author ever contemplated reprinting. The rise of historical criticism is interesting to admirers of his work, however, because it shows the development of his style and the wide intellectual range distinguishing the least borné of all the late Victorian writers, with the possible exception of Ruskin. It belongs to Wilde's Oxford days, when he was the unsuccessful competitor for the Chancellor's English Essay Prize. Perhaps Maudlin, which has never forgiven herself for nurturing the author of Ravenna, may be felicitated on having escaped the further intolerable honor that she might have suffered by seeing crowned again with paltry academic parsley the most highly gifted of all her children in the last century. Of the lectures, I have only included those which exist, so far as I know, in manuscript the reports of others in contemporary newspapers being untrustworthy. They were usually delivered from notes and were repeated at various towns in England and America. Here will be found the origin of Whistler's charges of plagiarism against the author. How far they are justified, the reader can decide for himself. Wilde always admitted that, Relying on an old and intimate friendship, he asked the artist's assistance on one occasion for a lecture he had failed to prepare in time. This I presume to be the address delivered to the art students of the Royal Academy in 1883, as Whistler certainly reproduced some of it as his own in the 10 o'clock lecture delivered subsequently in 1885. To what extent an idea may be regarded as a perpetual gift, or whether it is ethically possible to retrieve an idea like an engagement ring, it is not for me to discuss. 
I would only point out once more that all the works by which Wilde is known throughout Europe were written after the two friends had quarreled. That Wilde derived a great deal from the older man goes without saying, just as he derived so much in a greater degree from Pater, Ruskin, Arnold, and Burne Jones. Yet the tedious attempt to recognize in every jest of his some original by Whistler induces the criticism that it seems a pity the great painter did not get them off on the public before he was forestalled. Reluctance from an appeal to publicity was never a weakness in either of the men. Some of Wilde's more frequently quoted sayings were made at the Old Bailey, though their provenance is often forgotten, or on his deathbed. As a matter of fact, the genius of the two men was entirely different. Wilde was a humorist and a humanist before everything, and his wittiest jests have neither the relentlessness nor the keenness characterizing those of the clever American artist. Again, Whistler could no more have obtained the Berkeley gold medal for Greek, nor have written the importance of being earnest and the soul of man than Wilde, even if equipped as a painter, could have evinced that superb restraint characterizing the portraits of Miss Alexander, Carlyle, and other masterpieces. Poems in prose were to have been continued. They are the kind of stories which Wilde would tell at a dinner table, being invented on the spur of the moment, or inspired by the chance observation of someone who managed to get the traditional word in edgewise. Or they were developed from some phrase in a book Wilde might have read during the day. To those who remember hearing them from his lips, there must always be a feeling of disappointment on reading them. He overloaded their ornament when he came to transcribe them, and some of his friends did not hesitate to make that criticism to him personally. Though he affected annoyance, I do not think it prevented him from writing the others, which unfortunately exist only in the memories of friends. Miss A. May Lowther, however, has cleverly noted down some of them in a privately printed volume. Robert Ross The English Renaissance of Art The English Renaissance of Art was delivered as a lecture for the first time in the Chickering Hall, New York, on January 9, 1882. A portion of it was reported in the New York Tribune on the following day, and in other American papers subsequently. Since then, this portion has been reprinted more or less accurately from time to time in unauthorized editions. There are in existence no less than four copies of the lecture, the earliest of which is entirely in the author's handwriting. The others are typewritten and contain many corrections and additions made by the author in manuscript. These have all been collated, and the text here given contains as nearly as possible the lecture in the original form as delivered by the author during his tour in the United States. The English Renaissance of Art among the many debts which we owe to the supreme aesthetic faculty of Goethe is that he was the first to teach us to define beauty in terms the most concrete possible, to realize it, I mean, always in its special manifestations. So, in the lecture which I have the honor to deliver before you, I will not try to give you any abstract definition of beauty, any such universal formula for it as was sought for by the philosophy of the 18th century, still less to communicate to you that which in its essence is incommunicable, the virtue by which a particular picture or poem 
affects us with a unique and special joy, but rather to point out to you the general ideas which characterize the great English renaissance of art in this century, to discover their source as far as that is possible, and to estimate their future as far as that is possible. I call it our English renaissance because it is indeed a sort of new birth of the spirit of man, like the great Italian renaissance of the 15th century in its desire for a more gracious and comely way of life, its passion for physical beauty, its exclusive attention to form, its seeking for new subjects for poetry, new forms of art, new intellectual and imaginative enjoyments. And I call it our romantic movement because it is our most recent expression of beauty. It has been described as a mere revival of Greek modes of thought, and again as a mere revival of medieval feeling. Rather, I would say that to these forms of the human spirit, it has added whatever of artistic value, the intricacy and complexity and experience of modern life can give, taking from the one its clearness of vision and its sustained calm from the other its variety of expression and the mystery of its vision. For what, as Goethe said, is the study of the ancients but a return to the real world? For that is what they did. And what, said Mazzini, is medievalism but individuality? It is really from the union of Hellenism in its breadth, its sanity of purpose, its calm possession of beauty, with the adventive, the intensified individualism, the passionate color of the romantic spirit that springs the art of the 19th century in England, as from the marriage of Faust and Helen of Troy sprang the beautiful boy Euphorion. Such expressions as classical and romantic are, it is true, often apt to become the mere catchwords of schools. We must always remember that art has only one sentence to utter. There is for her only one high law, the law of form or harmony. Yet between the classical and romantic spirit, we may say that there lies this difference at least, that the one deals with the type, and the other with the exception. In the work produced under the modern romantic spirit, it is no longer the permanent, the essential truths of life that are treated of. It is the momentary situation of the one, the momentary aspect of the other, that art seeks to render. In sculpture, which is the type of one spirit, the subject predominates over the situation. In painting, which is the type of the other, the situation predominates over the subject. There are two spirits, then. The Hellenic spirit and the spirit of romance may be taken as forming the essential elements of our conscious intellectual tradition, of our permanent standard of taste. As regards their origin, in art as in politics, there is but one origin for all revolutions, a desire on the part of man for a nobler form of life, for a freer method and opportunity of expression. Yet, I think that in estimating the sensuous and intellectual spirit which presides over our English Renaissance, any attempt to isolate it in any way from the progress and movement and social life of the age that has produced it would be to rob it of its true vitality, possibly to mistake its true meaning. And in disengaging from the pursuits and passions of this crowded modern world, those passions and pursuits which have to do with art and the love of art, we must take into account many great events of history, 
which seemed to be the most opposed to any such artistic feeling. Alien then from any wild political passion, or from the harsh voice of a rude people in revolt, as our English Renaissance must seem in its passionate cult of pure beauty, its flawless devotion to form, its exclusive and sensitive nature, it is to the French Revolution that we must look for the most primary factor of its production, the first condition of its birth. That great revolution of which we are all the children, though the voices of some of us be often loud against it, that revolution to which, at a time, when even such spirits as Coleridge and Wordsworth lost heart in England, noble messages of love blown across seas came from your young republic. It is true that our modern sense of the continuity of history has shown us that neither in politics nor in nature are there revolutions ever, but evolutions only, and that the prelude to that wild storm which swept over France in 1789 and made every king in Europe tremble for his throne was first sounded in literature years before the Bastille fell and the palace was taken. The way for those red scenes by the Seine and Loire was paved by that critical spirit of Germany and England, which accustomed men to bring all things to the test of reason, or utility, or both, while the discontent of the people in the streets of Paris was the echo that followed the life of Emile and of Werther. For Rousseau, by silent lake and mountain, had called humanity back to the golden age that still lies before us, and preached a return to nature and passionate eloquence, whose music still lingers about our keen northern air. And Goethe and Scott had brought romance back again from the prison she had lain in for so many centuries. And what is romance but humanity? Yet, in the womb of the revolution itself, and in the storm and terror of that wild time, tendencies were hidden away that the artistic renaissance bent to her own service when the time came. A scientific tendency first, which has borne in our own day a brood of somewhat noisy titans, yet in the sphere of poetry has not been unproductive of good, I do not mean merely in its adding to enthusiasm that intellectual basis which is its strength, or that most obvious influence about which Wordsworth was thinking when he said very nobly that poetry was merely the impassioned expression in the face of science, and that when science would put on a form of flesh and blood, the poet would lend his divine spirit to aid the transfiguration. Nor do I dwell much on the great cosmical emotion and deep pantheism of science, to which Shelley has given its first, and Swinburne its latest glory of song, but rather on its influence on the artistic spirit, in preserving that close observation and the sense of limitation as well as clearness of vision, which are the characteristics of the real artist. The great and golden rule of art as well as of life, wrote William Blake, is that the more distinct, sharp, and defined the boundary line, the more perfect is the work of art, and the less keen and sharp, the greater is the evidence of weak imitation, plagiarism, and bungling. Great inventors in all ages knew this, Michelangelo and Albert Dürer are known by this and by this alone. And another time he wrote, with all the simple directness of 19th century prose, to generalize is to be an idiot. 
And this love of definite conception, this clearness of vision, this artistic sense of limit, is the characteristic of all great work and poetry. Of the vision of Homer, as of the vision of Dante, of Keats and William Morris, as of Chaucer and Theocritus. It lies at the base of all noble, realistic, and romantic work, as opposed to the colorless and empty abstractions of our own 18th century poets and of the classical dramatists of France, or of the vague spiritualities of the German sentimental school, opposed, too, to that spirit of transcendentalism which also was root and flower itself of the Great Revolution, underlying the impassioned contemplation of Wordsworth and giving wings and fire to the eagle-like flight of Shelley, and which in the sphere of philosophy, though displaced by the materialism and positiveness of our day, bequeathed two great schools of thought, the school of Newman to Oxford, the school of Emerson to America. Yet is this spirit of transcendentalism alien to the spirit of art, for the artist can accept no sphere of life in exchange for life itself. For him there is no escape from the bondage of the earth. There is not even the desire of escape. He is indeed the only true realist, Symbolism, which is the essence of the transcendental spirit, is alien to him. The metaphysical mind of Asia will create for itself the monstrous, many-breasted idol of Ephesus. But to the Greek, pure artist, that work is most instinct with spiritual life, which conforms most clearly to the perfect facts of physical life. The storm of revolution, as André Chenet said, blows out the torch of poetry. It is not for some little time that the real influence of such a wild cataclysm of things is felt. At first the desire for equality seems to have produced personalities of more giant and titan stature than the world had ever known before. Men heard the lyre of Byron and the legions of Napoleon. It was a period of measureless passions and of measureless despair. Ambition, discontent, were the chords of life and art. The age was an age of revolt, a phase through which the human spirit must pass, but one in which it cannot rest. For the aim of culture is not rebellion, but peace. The valley perilous, where ignorant armies clash by night, being no dwelling place meet for her, to whom the gods have assigned the fresh uplands and sunny heights and clear, untroubled air. And soon that desire for perfection, which lay at the base of the revolution, found in a young English poet its most complete and flawless realization. Phidias and the achievements of Greek art are foreshadowed in Homer. Dante prefigures for us the passion and color and intensity of Italian painting. The modern love of landscape dates from Rousseau, and it is in Keats that one discerns the beginning of the artistic renaissance of England. Byron was a rebel, and Shelley a dreamer, but in the calmness and clearness of his vision, his perfect self-control, his unerring sense of beauty, and his recognition of a separate realm for the imagination, Keats was the pure and serene artist the forerunner of the pre-Raphaelite school, and so of the great romantic movement of which I am to speak. Blake had indeed before him claimed for art a lofty spiritual mission, 
and had striven to raise design to the ideal level of poetry and music. But the remoteness of his vision, both in painting and poetry, and the incompleteness of his technical powers, had been adverse to any real influence. It is in Keats that the artistic spirit of this century first found its absolute incarnation. And these pre-Raphaelites, what were they? If you ask nine-tenths of the British public, what is the meaning of the word aesthetics? They will tell you it is the French for affectation, or the German for a dado. And if you inquire about the pre-Raphaelites, you will hear something about an eccentric lot of young men, to whom a sort of divine crookedness and holy awkwardness in drawing were the chief objects of art. To know nothing about their great men is one of the necessary elements of English education. As regards the pre-Raphaelites, the story is simple enough. In the year 1847, a number of young men in London, poets and painters, passionate admirers of Keats, all of them, formed the habit of meeting together for discussions on art, the result of such discussions being that the English Philistine public was roused suddenly from its ordinary apathy by hearing that there was in its midst a body of young men who had determined to revolutionize English painting and poetry. They called themselves the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. In England, then as now, it was enough for a man to try and produce any serious beautiful work to lose all his rights as a citizen. And besides this, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, among whom the names of Dante Rossetti, Holman Hunt, and Malay will be familiar to you, had on their side three things that the English public never forgives. Youth, power, and enthusiasm. Satire, always as sterile as it is shameful, and as impotent as it is insolent, paid them the usual homage which mediocrity pays to genius, doing here as always infinite harm to the public, blinding them to what is beautiful, teaching them that irreverence, which is the source of all vileness and narrowness of life, but harming the artist not at all, rather confirming him in the perfect rightness of his work and ambition. For to disagree with three-fourths of the British public on all points is one of the first elements of sanity, one of the deepest consolations in all moments of spiritual doubt. As regards the ideas these young men brought to the regeneration of English art, we may see at the base of their artistic creations a desire for a deeper spiritual value to be given to art, as well as a more decorative value. Pre-Raphaelites, they called themselves. Not that they imitated the early Italian masters at all, but that in their work, as opposed to the facile abstractions of Raphael, they found a stronger realism of imagination, a more careful realism of technique, a vision at once more fervent and more vivid, an individuality more intimate and more intense. For it is not enough that a work of art should conform to the aesthetic demands of its age, there must be also about it, if it is to affect us with any permanent delight, the impress of a distinct individuality, an individuality remote from that of ordinary men, and coming near to us only by virtue of a certain newness and wonder in the work, and through channels whose very strangeness makes us more ready to give them welcome. 
La personnalité, said one of the greatest of modern French critics. Voilà ce qui nous sauvera. But above all things was it a return to nature. That formula, which seems to suit so many and such diverse movements, they would draw and paint nothing but what they saw. They would try and imagine things as they really happened. Later there came to the old house by Blackfriars Bridge, where this young brotherhood used to meet and work, two young men from Oxford, Edward Burne Jones and William Morris the latter substituting for the simpler realism of the early days a more exquisite spirit of choice a more faultless devotion to beauty a more intense seeking for perfection a master of all exquisite design and of all spiritual vision it is of the school of florence rather than that of Venice that he is kinsman, feeling that the close imitation of nature is a disturbing element in imaginative art. The visible aspect of modern life disturbs him not. Rather is it for him to render eternal all that is beautiful in Greek, Italian, and Celtic legend. To Morris we owe poetry whose perfect precision and clearness of word and vision has not been excelled in the literature of our country, and by the revival of the decorative arts he has given to our individualized romantic movement the social idea and the social factor also. But the revolution accomplished by this clique of young men with Ruskin's faultless and fervent eloquence to help them, was not one of ideas merely, but of execution, not one of conceptions, but of creations. For the great eras in the history of the development of all the arts have been eras not of increased feeling or enthusiasm in feeling for art, but of new technical improvements primarily and specially. The discovery of marble quarries in the purple ravines of Pentelicus and on the little low-lying hills of the island of Paros gave to the Greeks the opportunity for that intensified vitality of action, that more sensuous and simple humanism to which the Egyptian sculptor working laboriously in the hard porphyry and rose-colored granite of the desert, could not attain. The splendor of the Venetian school began with the introduction of the new oil medium for painting. The progress in modern music has been due to the invention of new instruments entirely, and in no way to an increased consciousness on the part of the musician of any wider social aim. And so it is in poetry also. All this love of curious French meters, like the ballade, the villanelle, the rondelle, all this increased value laid on elaborate alliterations and on curious words and refrains, such as you will find in Dante Rossetti and Swinburne, is merely the attempt to perfect flute and viol and trumpet, through which the spirit of the age and the lips of the poet may blow the music of their many messages. And so it has been with this romantic movement of ours. It is a reaction against the empty conventional workmanship, the lax execution of previous poetry and painting, showing itself in the work of such men as Rossetti and Burne Jones by a far greater splendor of color, a far more intricate wonder of design than English imaginative art has shown before. In Rossetti's poetry and the poetry of Morris, Swinburne, and Tennyson, a perfect precision and choice of language, a style flawless and fearless, 
a seeking for all sweet and precious melodies, and a sustaining consciousness of the musical value of each word, are opposed to that value which is merely intellectual. In this respect, they are one with the romantic movement of France, of which not the least characteristic note was struck by Theophile Gautier's advice to the young poet to read his dictionary every day, as being the only book worth a poet's reading. While then the material of workmanship is being thus elaborated and discovered to have in itself incommunicable and eternal qualities of its own, qualities entirely satisfying to the poetic sense, and not needing for their aesthetic effect any lofty intellectual vision, any deep criticism of life, or even any passionate human emotion at all, the spirit and the method of the poet's working, what people call his inspiration, have not escaped the controlling influence of the artistic spirit. Not that the imagination has lost its wings, but we have accustomed ourselves to count their innumerable pulsations, to estimate their limitless strength, to govern their ungovernable freedom. To the Greeks, this problem of the conditions of poetic production and the places occupied by either spontaneity or self-consciousness in any artistic work had a peculiar fascination. We find it in the mysticism of Plato and in the rationalism of Aristotle. We find it later in the Italian Renaissance, agitating the minds of such men as Leonardo da Vinci. Schiller tried to adjust the balance between form and feeling, and Goethe to estimate the position of self-consciousness in art. Wordsworth's definition of poetry as emotion remembered in tranquility may be taken as an analysis of one of the stages through which all imaginative work has to pass. And in Keats's longing to be able to compose without this fever, I quote from one of his letters, his desire to substitute for poetic ardor a more thoughtful and quiet power, we may discern the most important moment in the evolution of that artistic life. The question made an early and strange appearance in your literature, too, and I need not remind you how deeply the young poets of the French Romantic movement were excited and stirred by Edgar Allan Poe's analysis of the workings of his own imagination in the creating of that supreme imaginative work which we know by the name of the Raven. In the last century when the intellectual and didactic element had intruded to such an extent into the kingdom which belongs to poetry, it was against the claims of the understanding that an artist like Goethe had to protest. The more incomprehensible to the understanding a poem is, the better for it, he said once. Asserting the complete supremacy of the imagination in poetry, as of reason in prose. But in this century, it is rather against the claims of the emotional faculties, the claims of mere sentiment and feeling, that the artist must react. The simple utterance of joy is not poetry, any more than a mere personal cry of pain, and the real experiences of the artist are always those which do not find their direct expression, but are gathered up and absorbed into some artistic form, which seems, from such real experiences, to be the farthest removed and the most alien. The heart contains passion, but the imagination alone contains poetry, says Charles Baudelaire. This, too, was the lesson that Théophile Gautier, most subtle of all modern critics, 
most fascinating of all modern poets, was never tired of teaching. Everybody is affected by a sunrise or a sunset. The absolute distinction of the artist is not his capacity to feel nature, so much as his power of rendering it. The entire subordination of all intellectual and emotional faculties to the vital and informing poetic principle is the surest sign of the strength of our Renaissance. We have seen the artistic spirit working, first in the delightful and technical sphere of language, the sphere of expression as opposed to subject, then controlling the imagination of the poet in dealing with his subject. And now I would point out to you its operation in the choice of subject, the recognition of a separate realm for the artist, a consciousness of the absolute difference between the world of art and the world of real fact, between classical grace and absolute reality, forms not merely the essential element of any aesthetic charm, but is the characteristic of all great imaginative work and of all great eras of artistic creation. Of the age of Phidias, as of the age of Michelangelo, of the age of Sophocles, as of the age of Goethe. Art never harms itself by keeping aloof from the social problems of the day. Rather, by so doing, it more completely realizes for us that which we desire. For to most of us, the real life is the life we do not lead, and thus remaining more true to the essence of its own perfection, more jealous of its own unattainable beauty, is less likely to forget form in feeling, or to accept the passion of creation as any substitute for the beauty of the created thing. The artist is indeed the child of his own age, but the present will not be to him a whit more real than the past. For like the philosopher of the platonic vision, the poet is the spectator of all time and of all existence. For him no form is obsolete, no subject out of date. Rather, whatever of life and passion the world has known, in desert of Judea or in Arcadian Valley, by the rivers of Troy or the rivers of Damascus, in the crowded and hideous streets of a modern city, or by the pleasant ways of Camelot, all lies before him like an open scroll. All is still instinct with beautiful life. He will take of it what is salutary for his own spirit, no more. Choosing some facts and rejecting others, with the calm artistic control of one who is in possession of the secret of beauty. There is indeed a poetical attitude to be adopted towards all things, but all things are not fit subjects for poetry. Into the secure and sacred house of beauty, the true artist will admit nothing that is harsh or disturbing, nothing that gives pain, nothing that is debatable, nothing about which men argue. He can steep himself, if he wishes, in the discussion of all the social problems of his day, poor laws and local taxation, free trade and bimetallic currency and the like. But when he writes on these subjects, it will be, as Milton nobly expressed it, with his left hand, in prose and not in verse, in a pamphlet and not in a lyric. This exquisite spirit of artistic choice was not in Byron. Wordsworth had it not. In the work of both these men, there is much that we have to reject, much that does not give us that sense of calm and perfect repose 
which should be the effect of all fine imaginative work. But in Keats, it seemed to have been incarnate, and in his lovely ode on a Grecian urn, it found its most secure and faultless expression. In the pageant of the earthly paradise, and the knights and ladies of Burne Jones, it is the one dominant note. It is to no avail that the muse of poetry be called, even by such a clarion note as Whitman's, to migrate from Greece and Ionia, and to placard removed and to let on the rocks of the snowy Parnassus. Calliope's call is not yet closed, nor are the epics of Asia ended. The Sphinx is not yet silent, nor the fountain of Castellet dry, for art is very life itself and knows nothing of death. She is absolute truth and takes no care of fact. She sees, as I remember Mr. Swinburne insisting on at dinner, that Achilles is even now more actual and real than Wellington, not merely more noble and interesting as a type and figure, but more positive and real. And on that note, we've reached the halfway point in the English Renaissance in art. So that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading from Essays and Lectures by Oscar Wilde. Going in, I had no idea what this essay would be about, so I was particularly excited to see him talk about the Pre-Raphaelites, since I love that period in art and poetry. Reading his own opinions about them was particularly delightful, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, I'll leave a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.